Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, we dive into an industry that I have spent the past 22 years of my life working in, healthcare, but not the typical way of looking at healthcare. In this episode, we discuss privileges and how that may affect careers and individual care provided to patients. Now, first, let me start out by saying being privileged is not the same as racism, but some could argue there is a link. Dr. Jennifer Harvey, who wrote Raising White Kids, Bringing Up Children in a Racially Unjust America, described it well. Allow me to paraphrase. Privilege in the social sense can best be described as unearned and unequal access to social goods that for some experience simply because of their race, whether they want to or not. If there are those among us who experience lack of access, harmful treatment, or negative stereotypes because they are a person of color, then those who experience the inequitable distribution of more access being given the benefit of the doubt, unearned positive stereotypes or credit to them, and more, a link can be made. However, acknowledging privilege does not mean you did not work for your success. There is a misconception that acknowledging the existence of privilege is the equivalent of agreeing that the work rewarded was not earned. Acknowledging one privilege does not mean an individual has never worked for anything, but there is an acknowledgement whatever work was done or not, there was always wind at their back, making those efforts go further. In contrast, people of color in a racist system face headwinds. There is a growing sentiment with data to support the theory that individuals of color work does not typically yield the same successful results. But how does privilege affect healthcare? Let's take a look at the latest pandemic for an example. Our black American neighbors are dying from COVID-19 at a rate of 2.5 times faster than our white American neighbors. Many would argue underlying health conditions and various factors. But as discussed in this episode, access to health care closer to home is a privilege that few have. Understanding privilege is one thing, but using that privilege for the effect change for better future for everyone. Now that is innovation. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the business for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community education and social rights. The best part, Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and works to create custom packages and services that fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, unpersonal, and out-of-touch agencies and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook or Instagram. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Monsef. Brave Care, which is actually health care. Darius Monsef, the owner. Darius, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me on today's show. Please, let's introduce the world to Darius. I am a technology entrepreneur that more recently ended up in healthcare because I have three young kids, nine, six, and now almost four. I met my co-founder who's a pediatric emergency skilled doctor because my middle daughter split her chin in a bike park. It's the first emergency care experience we had with any of them. This is in uh, Northeast Portland. There's the Lumberyard, which is an awesome indoor yep. bike park. Yeah. 
my four-year-old was moments before super proud of her shredding on this ramp with all these bigger kids and then just launched herself oh, out no. of her face. Uh, facial injuries bleed a lot. Pretty intense moment, but I really was just sort of tactical. I was like, all right, you know, chin stitches. We had to figure out what to do. I carried her to the front desk to get a butterfly band-aid for her chin and was like, I'm on the opposite side of town from where I live. So where do I go from here? Smart enough, my now co-founder had put flyers to his pediatric urgent care at a bike park. It's sort of like trampoline parks, park parks. Oh, like, smart. Where are people going to get injured with kids? Was able to drive over to his clinic. And on the drive over, I'm processing. I've been to urgent cares before. I don't think they were really high quality. Not sure how I felt about that for her. But I've also been to the ER. And this is my most, she's the most sensitive sort of shy of all my girls. I was like, I really didn't want to take her in yeah. that environment. So drove over, got to the clinic, nice, modern uh, aesthetic, felt really comfortable. The providers were clearly great with kids. They're on her level. They're speaking to her to comfort her. Once she inhaled this nasal versed, uh, which is all loopy, it was probably the most talkative she's ever been in her whole life, but was a chance for us to, to get really good care and experience that. And I came away from that one going, oh, that was really cool. Then the next weekend, and hopefully you won't know this, what croup and strider sounds like in a one-year-old, but I, I didn't know what those things were. So I was left to Google and try and figure it out at a sleepless night, really uncomfortable. My wife was out of town both these weekends. So I either get dad credit or I lose dad credit. (laughs) We've not settled the score on this one yet, but basically had a really terrible second night, ended up back in his care. And that one was emotionally traumatic because most important thing in my life, other than sort of hold her, I really couldn't do anything to help her. So a two hour experience there because the care was thoughtful. You know, we were seen immediately, but we didn't get rushed through. And I had the space to just sort of take care of her. And we look for any system uh, signs that maybe is escalating. But I came out of that one going like, Man, I genuinely love little kids. I don't know. I, you might not have seen it. I have a Lightning McQueen car outside that I drove over here. Oh, so yeah. I saw it. <laughs> what I do with my spare time is, you know, make kids happy. It's what I want to do. And meeting Corey, my now co was like, man, I think I can bring better user experience to pediatric care. I can focus on kind of the operational, the systems, the technology. I need a great pediatric partner. I clearly trust him with the life of my kids. So I don't have a higher level of trust than that. It's the perfect timing for us to come together and say, how do we take what we did and make sure every kid in the country has access to the best pediatric care. Nice. So let's let's tell the listeners at home, what is Brave Care? Yeah. Pediatric, primary, urgent, and remote care. Where we started was 25 million ER visits a year for children in the U.S. Vast majority of those don't need the emergency department's level of care. And then they get a 10x bill that they would get from an urgent care because just systems are different. So- What we wanted to do is give an alternative place where people could go after hours, nights and weekends. But what we realized when we started building this, nobody wants to have a relationship with an urgent care. Your customer is actively trying to never to come into you. So if we also did primary care, one, it would be more comprehensive. So you now need to know one person rather than we go here for primary, but we go there for urgent. Like, you know, we're open 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week for primary, urgent, walk in, kind of, you can call our triage nurse phone line 24 hours a day. Just trying to be the most complete pediatric care for parents with their kids. I'm in a privileged position having had previous exits in tech entrepreneurship. I can get the best care for my kid. Every parent and every kid deserves access to that. So I want to build something that opens up that ability. You know, your daughter, you mentioned your daughter getting hurt and busting her chin open. Was that kind of the catalyst to start Brave Care or was there something in between? That was definitely the catalyst. It was the combination of the that weekend and then the croup where, you know, it's interesting. So I had exits. My wife and I are both born and raised in Hawaii. We had moved back there thinking that we were going to like settle and build our dream home in our hometown. I had a cattle ranch. I sort of lost my mind for four years thinking that I sort of transition out and for better or worse, I'm really wired by doing hard things and startups are hard things every single day. There's always some kind of chaos that comes from it. So I knew I needed to find inspiration again. I'd gone through this, like, you know, almost a pros and cons chart exercise. What do I, what should I be building? What do I like? And I ended up with, you know, in Hawaii, if we were going to stay there, it was kind of real estate and there was things that made sense in the industry. And I previously had built design companies like I like those things. I don't love them. I genuinely love kids. I'd rather if you were a toddler right now than an adult. <laughs> like that's where I would rather spend my time. So it was this super obvious, like, of course I should be doing this. Like, and this is what they say. There's very strong founder market fit here. I'm the right person to be spending my time on building this company. Nice. For the listeners at home talking about some great stuff, especially like the entrepreneurism, right? The building it. Can you kind of take us through the process of how Brave Care was created? A typical thing that they say in startups is move fast and break things. How do you build something that people really want to use and that will love without investing too much time to figure out nobody actually wants this thing in the first place? Healthcare is hard. You don't move fast and break things with, you know, people's lives on the line and as kids and their health. 
fortunate that I had met somebody who had already started a pediatric clinic. It turned out to be this sort of Goldilocks perfect amount of time where Corey had started his clinic, had run it about a year on his own before he realized like, dang, I'm an excellent doctor. The business side of this thing is what it was stressing him out. Yeah. And so it was yeah. this perfect, we saw direct value in each other. He'd already started one clinic. How do we take the model he'd started with and then evolve it? What was really cool is that, uh, so for COVID, I've been out of Portland, although we live here, we went back to our house in Hawaii and this is my first sort of course COVID trip back. And I went to our Selwood clinic, which is the new one that we built during COVID. It was the first like from the ground up new clinic. And I myself was impressed when I was sort of looked at our lab area of like, oh, we do like real stuff here. <laughs> I, often I just sort of looking through Zoom and seeing it. I don't get to experience of like, oh, wow, this I, if I didn't have a medical co-founder, I really shouldn't be doing the things that we're doing. So it was the right partners. We have two other co-founders who are excellent on technology and operations. And so the four of us are very well-rounded in being able to take the seed of what was already created once and then try and build a way to replicate it and scale it. Nice. You know, seed is a great word because it kind of pivots into the next conversation. Uh, you know, one of the things I read is this past April 21st, 2021, Brave Care announced $10 million Series A funding. For the listeners at home, what is Series A funding and why is it so important for Brave Care's future? Yeah, there's sort of a spectrum of, so, you know, the weird thing about startups and venture capital and, you know, historically Silicon Valley has sort of been seen as the epicenter of that interesting things post COVID decentralization of this previously, even before COVID New York, Austin, Boulder, LA, like other markets were pretty well defined. You're seeing a lot of this dispersion. Portland has always struggled with this kind of seed capital for startups, but you start with things that are friends and family. That's a very privileged label for that because whose friends and family are cutting them hundred thousand dollar checks for startups. (laughs) But the idea is that it's just people who really believe in you more than the idea. I'm willing to take the earliest bet. You get to seed rounds, which are typically either angels or professional funds who are saying, all right, I think there's some viability here. We'll write a half million, million dollar seed stage check. Then often you can take the seed funding and once you sort of get on the fundraising horse, you're kind of on that horse for a while because you're accelerating much faster than would logically make sense. Like your plan is to lose money every month because the high growth gets you further to some outcome. And so we're, we're on that. We're scaling very quickly. We'd raised $8 million before we raised the Series A. So we'd sort of untraditionally raised a small a million dollar seed round to get started. Then we went through Y Combinator, which is a Bay Area tech accelerator. Um, which culminates at a fundraising day. We use that to raise a $5 million seed round. It's hard to do what we do. So capital was important. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up raising this kind of bridge round during COVID because one of the challenges was overall pediatric care was reducing capacity. Again, as I just mentioned, I was planning to lose money every month. That's the business model for startups. A typical business is not. So if we, rather than skeleton, let's lean into COVID, increase our locations, increase our capacity, our technology, it meant when there would be some return, we'd be better positioned to capture it. So it was a harder thing to do in the bleakest days. You just run faster into the dark, but we were able to raise enough money to get the second clinic open in Portland. And then there wouldn't there really was a sort of social return and uh, socialization of kids and getting kids outside more and COVID testing. We've had a very dramatic return in patient visits because we scaled what we did. And that allowed us to have the traction and business validation to go to investors who are now even more seasoned and traditional and say, hey, now we want to scale what is already working. And that was the $10 million to open another four clinics this year and then continue on that sort of national expansion path. Nice. And so like for the listeners at home, including myself, you know, doing um, crowdsourcing is, is pretty foreign to me as well. What are some of the things that, you know, a venture capitalist are going to be asking? So for the listeners at home that want to or are thinking of going down this route, what should they be prepared for? They ask for different things at different stages. So okay. somebody who's just first walking into this, it really is these friends and family or angel investors. I am an angel investor. My view on this is there's no three-year plan. There's not a five-year business plan. Like I have a 10-year vision, but after six months, one year, the roadmap is going to respond to whatever is happening and, and changing in the market. So you don't need it in startups because also things move so quickly. So what I, if I'm talking to somebody and I generally invest thematically and health, children, things that I'm more passionate about. Do I believe this person is really passionate about this and has an expertise? Do I think there's an opportunity in this market to really disrupt thinking something? In my case, do I think this is good for the world? That's enough for me. And I write small checks, but I, there are people who at the same kind of information make decisions on bigger chess. There's not a lot to do diligence on in the earliest stages of a startup. So it's typically the fundraising process is organized around a seed deck like 10 to 20 slides. There's not a business plan. Maybe you have a product. Maybe you have early customers. Those are all things that help, but it's really investing in the seeds stage of an idea. 
Nice. One of the things you mentioned that was very interesting is, you know, that you keep kind of going back to it is the friends and family piece, Mm -hmm. right? And how important that is. How important was it for your beginning? In the very beginning of my career, it was super important. So what's not visible on, you know, voice here is I get to enjoy nearly every privilege. I'm tall, straight, white, male. I went to private school as a kid. I had every benefit sort of pushing me forward into life. And the other one that was, was family support. So early in my entrepreneurial career, I moved home to live with my family. So I was saving money and could do that. In one of my first businesses, my grandmother loaned me $30,000 to get started in that. It was a lot of her retirement. Uh, I had lost all that money. So mentally still feel like that's owed somewhere. She has since passed. Um, so there's nowhere to return it to, but hopefully I've returned it in other ways to the community mm-hmm. and investing in women that are strong leaders as she was, but having even just the family who could support me, I was broke multiple times. So a brother that could bail me out, a friend that I could live with, those are all privileges that I enjoyed. And I think probably all the way back, one of the reasons I'm probably a successful entrepreneur is that I had somebody, my dad, very egotistical, capitalistic driven, you know, I'm somehow better than everybody else because I'm a monsef. I've sort of been told I'm special my whole life. And then you just sort of believe it. So it's a subtle thing, but just because I believe there's an opportunity for me, I actually went and looked for it or I believe that it could be and should be mine. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, you you know, you kind of talk about how you faked it till you make it kind of thing. But you also have that insight of of the privilege that you mentioned. Hmm. How important is that, you know, to grow in a business is kind of knowing that piece. Again, you probably it's the fake it till you make it. Either you're born with those privileges and I I needed them all. Um, I was incredibly lucky to have had exits and success. I don't think that takes anything away from the hard work I also had Definitely. to put in. Mm-hmm. I just know amazing people who have worked harder than me who haven't had success yet. Mm. So you don't just get it because you work hard. There's a huge luck component and I don't feel bad saying that I was lucky enough to have had that. You know, that's that's funny. Luck, uh, you know, I was talking to another entrepreneurs about this is, you know, sometimes luck plays a lot into being a successful entrepreneur. I think it's a huge part. And there's two ways to think about it. Luck is absolutely required. And in some ways you can also make your own luck. It's a manifest destiny. It's the secret. Yeah. It's uh, I just recently bought a Toyota RAV4 and I've seen like 500 of them today. <laughs> the the like, law of averages, right? Yeah. It's like, well, <laughs> if you are in a mode where you're looking for opportunities, you'll just see more opportunities around. So it's the opportunity to find access to something that really was there the entire time, but you didn't even think about it. And so one of the, probably the greatest privileges I have is that I was looking for it. If you don't have that, I wrote an article once about fundraising. that's sort of like you either are hot and you have all the attention yeah. or you manufacture your own heat. There are sort of ways of creating uh, in fundraising, at least the busier you are, the better, like nobody wants to invest in somebody who has no interest, make a concerted effort to run my fundraising sprint, to pack my schedule. Don't send an email that says, Hey, uh, yeah, I'd love to meet with you anytime next week is good. You'd be like, Hey, Tuesday at two or Thursday at four, like my schedule is wide open, but I want yeah. you to believe that I'm busy and I'm prioritizing my time. So there were things that I could do that helped shape the perception of what I wanted people to believe. And that I sort of internally knew to be true. Reality had just not caught up. One of the things you were kind of mentioning too, during the fundraising piece is venture capitalists, they're not really just investing in the idea, but they're also investing in the entrepreneur. Yes, because ideas in some ways are worthless. It's about execution. I mean, I assume every idea I've had more people in the world have exactly the same idea as me. And I'm generally pretty open even about what we're doing and how we're planning to do it because I now, after a career of doing this, I'm very confident in our ability to execute. So if somebody out executes me, they won that one. The nice thing about also the iterative pace of startups and evolution is it's sort of like you maybe won the battle will win the war. Like Mm. having competition is almost good sometimes. Yeah. I find it right now in Carbon Health, who's not really even in our space. I just admire what they do. They're several years ahead of us. Hundreds of clinics maybe now are on the horizon. Dramatic impact on COVID. It's like, that's what we want to model after. I want to choose somebody that creates the competitive edge in us. And Carbon, I think, is doing a great job. That's great. So where where do you see Brave Care in the next five or 10 years? It's to be uh, what's locally referenced, but a sort of band field for children's medicine. We want to have clinics in not just tier one markets. You know, the, the idea here that we're not just building concierge medicine for affluent families. We need to make sure that it works in rural communities. Mm, yeah. I can't, I don't have a model that only works on a $150 a year membership. We need to make sure that the average working family can afford brave care, that it works in, in Medicaid and the kinds of, you know, payers that people will have. But the goal is to be in every major market and every, uh, and that's major be like tier two or tier three kind of city. I really want to find a way to serve rural communities. I grew up in a 12,000 person town. 
I love the people in that town. They deserve access to a brave care. So my goal is to figure out how to get them into those communities. Man, you're talking to my heart, my friend. I grew up in rural Mount Angel, Oregon, baby. We had about 30 people graduate with us. <laughs> yeah, I had 120 in my whole school, so 27 in my graduate. Oh, yeah, I think we had about 250 in our whole school. We're like, cheers, right? Everybody knows your name right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> As you're scaling, right, what, what have you found to be the most difficult part? We, you know, we have an aspect of what we do, which is medicine. There's retail and then we have physical spaces. We also are a consumer tech company. So we couldn't do what we want to do. My analogy here is uh, I think we're in the Pacific Northwest. So Starbucks is ex- generally accepted as a good thing, although boutique coffee is important. Starbucks is incredibly good at what they do worldwide. So I can go into any Starbucks in the country world and it's going to be like, oh, it's like my neighborhood one. We want to create the same consistent experience, no matter which brave care you go to. We know who you are. You walk in. It's like, how do you know who I am? It's like, well, you made an appointment. We can see the historical health record. We know the things your kid likes. It feels as personal as if it's the one you always go into. You can't build that experience without very good technology behind it to make sure that it's driven not by a less empathetic, you know, put the screens in between us as patient and provider. But like, you know, if you're coming in for your well visit, once your kid turns four, you're going to have an annual well visit. So part of that visit is... What happened in the last year? You're like, I got parent brain. Like, I don't know what happened yeah. two weeks ago. <laughs> but why are we spending that time trying to remember this historical record? That should have been collected already. Like, we, we should have that. We should go, let's talk about what happened four months ago when there was a little bit of a weight decline. What was going on in the life of your kid? Like, it could be so much more personal if we use mm. good technology rather than I think the fear of a lot of current pediatricians is like, oh, they've experienced bad technology. I don't want to get in the way of the relationship I have with my patient. We're trying to help enable a more personal relationship leveraging technology. Yeah, that's amazing. You've had a lot of experience in entrepreneurship in the past. What other kind of ventures have you done? So I am the stereotypical kid who was like buying and selling baseball cards or (laughs) washing cars in the neighborhood to make money. That's been wired, you know, in me since I was little. I also was sort of mischievous in high school. I got bad grades and good good SAT scores. I actually now run a nonprofit summer camp for kids in Hawaii, where I'm from, that tries to give kids the three main things that I had, which was access to a computer because my dad could buy me a nice one. I had good mentors and peers because I was able to go to private school. Um, and then I had that voice that told me every day, like, you're really special. Something's going to come to you. And so we try and just do those three things for kids. Sort of always believed that to be true. And then my mom bought me a computer. So I started tinkering with things. My first company, which eventually became venture funded, I built myself. I designed it. I wrote the code. I had worked as a web programmer. So I was able to sort of build my own things, which allowed me to iterate and learn a ton because I've shipped a bunch of bad things. (laughs) I mean, there's some benefit if you have to convince the co-founder to join you, there's a good quality filter there. If you have no quality filter, you ship a bunch of things that maybe shouldn't exist in the world. But one of them just seemed to catch some attention. It was a basically hot or not for color when I first built it. It was funny to me. I'd taken a class at the Art Institute of Portland around color theory. It's like, but do you really dislike this orange? I like it. Like, what does it matter? This felt weird. So it was just color squares. Like, do you attractive? Basically now it would be swipe right or swipe left right. on the color square. <laughs> but you could also make color combinations. And those palettes that I allowed people to build was a utility. And it was a shortcut for designers. And it was this creative community in the beginning of Web 2.0, which is user-generated content, all these social communities we have now people being able to like create and share together. And I shipped that right at the right time. It got traction. It became a five-time Webby nominee. It's Webby's are terrible name for like the most <laughs> prestigious name in technology awards. It was a five-time Webby nominee for best community. And there was several million visitors at its peak, but there was wow. never a clear business. It was like an ad-based website. I hate online ads. So I'm fighting against my own business model by not putting ads <laughs> on my website. And so I struggled for a number of years and I have a memory of being back in Portland. This is the winding journey of entrepreneurship where my business account and my personal account are overdrawn. And I just was basically at the post office waiting to see if this ad check would come in because I have nothing like totally broke and it didn't come in again. And I thought, I'm just going to drive to the coast. I don't know where I'm going. I'm going out 26. I'm just going to like, I don't, I don't know where I'll end up, but I don't care. I was sort of losing it. And then I got, I don't know, five miles out and my check engine light came on. It was like, you literally cannot run from Uh, your problems right now. And so I went home and I just basically turned everything off for two days. And the healthy lesson there was like, I turned it all back on and like, it was fine. I just was where I was. So maybe I'd hit rock bottom and there wasn't anything below it, but it felt like, okay, I can rebuild from here, but continue to build this color website. was fortunate to go to Microsoft for a little bit and get paid well to keep tinkering on my thing on the side. Eventually that got me into Y Combinator. Having been from the Pacific Northwest, this is maybe 2000, 
four or five is where I started as an entrepreneur here in, in Portland, there really wasn't a lot of a community here. There wasn't as many tech entrepreneurs. There wasn't a lot of tech funding. I have always appreciated the work that Rick's done at Silicon Florist and now Pi of being really a community cheerleader and connecting people. But I didn't have a lot of resources. So when I went down to San Francisco and got the chance of like, whoa, this is the community. This is where stuff is happening. Those were pretty transformative years for me. I was able to iterate on color levers. We realized what we were really trying to do is make design simple and accessible. The best way that we could do that was a marketplace that was all the creative assets one would want under one roof because you went to Devere, you know, for photo at, you know, this other uh, DeFont for a font. It was just like, or Veer and DeFont. If you're buying a font right now, might you want a graphic? Might you want, and you know, all these other assets? There wasn't a digital Etsy and where Etsy was handmade goods. We wanted to make mouse made goods, our marketplace. Mm. So we launched creative market to this design audience. I'd already been building for several years and it was the overnight success. It was just like, Oh, that's product market fit. That's where somebody's willing to pay for something because it's valuable to them, but was also valuable to us. I was fortunate that there was a pretty dramatic trajectory there and then acquired by Autodesk in 2014, which is a life changing outcome for us. Nice. You know, it's kind of funny. You mentioned Rick from Pi. Mm. Rick, if you're listening, I'm going to get you on the show, buddy. I'm gonna have, I can't wait because he has, I, I, I have a feeling he has some amazing stories. For, for the listeners at home, the individuals that are thinking of starting their own business, what advice would you have for them? One is a lot of good entrepreneurship comes out of chaos and change. We just came off this year. A lot of things were disrupted. It's sad in a community like Portland where there's a lot of great restaurants to know that a lot of those closed. And yeah. I try and just remain positive. Like, so something great is going to get started where something great once existed. So if you can try and find a positive mindset and say, hey, the world's changing a little bit and change, there will be some opportunities. Where could I bring something to that to improve the way things work? I generally would prefer people build like good things for the world. Like, I don't know if we need another something social. That's really yeah, just don't, like, we don't need another TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Um, TikTok really is amazing creative uh, <laughs> platform to it. So some special stuff happens there, but uh, I don't want to be judgmental of people's interests, but like, I don't need another vape company or something. There you go. Do something positive that we all need and we all want. And then honestly, it's to, it's to kind of start small, but also share it quickly. So I think what happens for a lot of people who have not had an experience in entrepreneurship is they keep everything really guarded. This is not, I had a brilliant idea. And if I tell anybody, they're going to steal it. Because yeah. back to my previous point of view, your idea really isn't worth that much. It's share it. One, you're going to find out whether or not people actually really like it. Share it beyond what was actually a downside of Portland's very supportive community. Is everybody so supportive? It's like, yeah, you totally should do that. And I'll support you. And if you put a, a tweet up to that, you're going to sell 10 products, you'll sell all 10 to the community who just does it because they love you. And go to people who don't know you, go yeah. to your actual customer and try and sell this thing. Are they willing to pay for it? Do you, do the flint metrics make sense? You need economics here prove that like there's a real business to be had. The sooner that you can figure out, the better. Because I think another thing inexperienced people do is spend too long on things that mm -hmm. they think could exist. Like, oh, I'm not ready yet. If I just did this one more thing and, you know, opportunity cost two years of your life have gone by. Yeah. And it's better to have sort of failed quick than to have failed slowly because now you miss all the time. You could have taken that failure and the learned lessons and then reapply it to the next opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's that's really true. And I know this, this is a horrible pun, but you, you can't be afraid to kill your baby kind of thing. You know, your, your idea. We actually do this in Brave Care a lot because there's a lot of things of like, we're killing it and we're crushing it. It's like, is there not better? I know we got to figure it out. We, we we, we, um, we'll figure something out. Yeah. We'll definitely figure something out. Now for you, looking back on it, what advice would you give your younger self? I've thought about this a couple of times because I've done a bunch of dumb stuff and I've <laughs> suffered through a lot, but I genuinely am very happy with my life now. And if I changed anything in the past and it, you know, a uh, butterfly effect changed, like, I got to live with the mistakes that I made and the things uh, hopefully I guess if I could change the harm I might have unintentionally caused people to still end up where I am, then sure, I would happily do that. But I think for better or worse, the mistakes I made, the struggles I had helped me get here. So yeah. I don't think I would honestly change anything. There's probably like, yeah, buy Tesla and Amazon and Bitcoin or something, but <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't want that thing either. It's interesting because we, at Brave Care, we care a lot about the culture and the company we're building long-term. So we haven't, we hired a full-time coach. So somebody who just there to help you grow as a person and help you communicate with others. And she'd asked me in one of our coaching sessions, like wave a magic wand and change anything for Brave Care. Like what would, what would you use it for? And my answer was more capital. <laughs> and I thought about afterwards, like, I couldn't, because I wanted the capital so I could open more clinics. I right. could have wished for more clinics and all the things. I actually don't want that. I want the chance to go do the work. I don't want to skip ahead to the end 
I know it's going to be hard, but I think that's the value is I want to actually go do those things. I don't just want the end result. Yeah. Well, looping it back around, right. From when we started this conversation, you said that's one of your passions is trying to do the hard thing. I need an opportunity and then going back to be a high school athlete of like, I really want to take the last shot of a game. I want the pressure. I like it. I get best when it's really stressful. Yeah. And this is what happened in Hawaii. I was doing nothing and I got depressed. I basically, with all those layers of privilege, it was hard for me to recognize why am I not happy every day? And what is happiness anyway? Joy, something. I'm like, I just don't feel good. And it was like, oh, I'm depressed. That's what this is. So, and it took for like a full pop moment of that release to go, I'm really not happy and I needed to change. And it was fortunate that I sort of found the right thing to iterate. I was like, right, I need to spend my time in things that are hard and get me to raise to the occasion. Yeah, that's great. Now, now for the folks at home, you know, that have kids, where, where can they get uh, seen? Where, where, are you, where are you located? Uh, one, first, bravecare.com. So we also have things like symptom checkers and our COVID symptom checker. And we just ship some illness pages because I've been the parent. We often try and obviously put ourselves in the shoes of the people we serve. I've been to Brave Care 24 times as a parent, not as the CEO. <laughs> so I get to unfortunately experience things as we do. But, you know, if you're trying to Google what croup is at midnight, what we're, we, you don't want a 4,000 word essay that's on a medical like literature website. It's just somebody who's got the brightness turned down because their kid finally went to sleep in their arm and they're trying to read. So how do I take that information and make it as easy for you as possible to digest that? So there's a good resource on our website. That's where also you could book appointments. We're in Southeast Portland right now, opening in Southwest near Beaverton, also in Austin and North Carolina. Uh, but we also do virtual visits and we have a 24 hour nurse triage line that you can also find in our app, Brave Care on both app platforms. Awesome. Darius Monseth, the co-founder of Brave Care. Thank you so much for joining us on the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.